And welcome back to ITB Berlin 2022. And now it's all about getting to and from a destination sustainably. Joining us on the panel are sustainability and mobility expert. A warm welcome to Thomas Becker. He's the Vice President Sustainability and Mobility at the BMW Group. Uh, we are welcoming Fatima de Gloria. She is Vice President Sustainability at Air France KLM Royal Dutch Airlines. A warm welcome as well to Andreas Andreas. Andrea Kupfer, she's the Senior Director of Communications, Public Affairs and Responsibility at Flix Mobility. And to Sebnem Erzan, she is the Head of Travel Sustainability at Google. Let's welcome our guests. All right, welcome, uh, Thomas. Welcome, it's great having you here. Welcome on board. Welcome, Fatima. Welcome, Andrea. And as well, welcome, Sebnem. Thanks for being here this morning. So first off, uh, we'll go straight into it. In fact, uh, we don't have that much time. So if we look at the modes of transport for a vacation, uh, in going to a destination, Germans really rely heavily on planes, but almost half of the travelers are using cars. Uh, personal mobility is obviously an essential component right, of, of the travel and tourism experience. I, I could just imagine driving uh, you know, under the open skies in the North Sea or the serpentine roads in the Alps. Um, there's something to be said really about the thrill of automobiles. So I'm turning to you, Thomas, first. Uh, in a recent article I read, BMW wants to be the most sustainable manufacturer of personal transport. So how do you plan to achieve this? And perhaps more importantly, what are the advances uh, to expect in terms of <clears throat> sustainability and personal mobility? Yeah, I think what uh, we have been defining as, as our targets and we <coughs> make clear that these are targets which are measured and where we are held accountable for, including um, our management is uh, about comprehensively bringing down our CO2 footprint. Uh, and that has more than just one level. The first one and the obvious one, which is in the forefront of the current discussion, is the shift in drive trains. We have been doubling the sales, for example, of our electric minis last year compared to the year before. We have exceeded uh, our regulatory requirements uh, in the European Union uh, by 10 grams of CO2 uh, uh, per car uh, uh, and per kilometer that we have uh, uh, been uh, which is an expression of the fact that we have ramping up uh, our supply of highly efficient vehicles, both electric, plug-in hybrids, uh, and also combustion engine cars uh, continuously. But this is only one piece of the equation. Now, the other one is the energy that actually goes into our products. So the electricity that is used in electric vehicles, for example. And here we are working closely with many partners, with many partners from the industry and outside the industry in order to really effectively bring the footprint of the kilometer travel down. For example, by supporting our customers in charging when, for example, wind energy is available in abundance. We do this in California, for example, uh, making sure that in the fast charging network that is operated by us together with other manufacturers across Europe named Ionity, we use renewable energy so that the customers can be sure that no matter where they plug, they actually make a positive contribution, uh, also including the supply chain of energy. And lastly, a big and increasingly important piece of the equation is our supply chain. In a business as usual scenario, an electric vehicle will have twice the CO2 footprint compared to a conventional one. And that means that we, for example, have negotiated with all our battery suppliers that they exclusively use renewable energies. We are heavily working with many of our suppliers of steel and aluminum uh, to do the same. But, and this is a final piece, we will only get about half of the distance to target to our 2030 objectives by replacing energy. The rest has to come from replacing primary by secondary material. So no matter whether you look at plastics, whether you look at aluminum, whether you look at steel, it's about ramping up the recycled content. Mm. And here we need to make rapid progress over the next years. Mm. And on to the other side of travel, which as we heard is obviously the other 50% or oh, when you travel internationally is air travel. Um, Fatima, we've seen some of your ad campaigns about flying responsibly. 
Tell us, what does it actually mean at KLM and Air France uh, to fly responsibly? What does it mean to you? And also, what have you learned from the bans of short-haul flights, so inner France flights, what, that you can share with us or potentially other airlines as well? Sure. Um, fly responsibly, it fits in a wider trend around uh, consuming responsibly. So it was at the time a very unusual appeal coming from KLM in this case. It was a KLM campaign. And basically, it is asking you to reconsider uh, the choices that you make. Could you have a combination of a business and leisure trip together? Or could you have um, a trip that is less frequent but longer? Combine them in different ways. Uh, occasionally take the train. Uh, so really reconsider the way you are uh, flying because we, we did want to change the way we were com communicating about sustainability. And we want to be uh, engaging all uh, stakeholders uh, in this journey, because it is a journey. Uh, it's not just a physical journey. It is a transformation that all industries will need to go through. And we are doing this with our sector. So next to the fact that this was an appeal to customers to think about uh, travel, it is also an appeal to all our partners in the sector and in the trades to think with us. We are already doing a lot and we have been doing for over 20 years. We are uh, actively working across the sector, getting everyone invo involved, whether it is universities with which, for instance, we are working on uh, the Flying V concept, a very new framework for, uh, for aircraft for the future. Uh, we work with uh, all the partners in the industry. We would also like to uh, ask everyone listening in today, how can you become uh, more involved? How can you, for instance, get more customers to know what are sustainable aviation fuels? So Air France and KLM started since this year to introduce structurally half to 1% of SAF. And you may think it's not that much. No, but it is an important first step. So where can you also get uh, people engaged? That is uh, 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 really what all this campaign is about. Let's everyone get on board. On your second question, uh, the short haul flights, indeed, under uh, two and a half hours as part of the state aid package, Air France uh, abolished these. Um, it's going well. Uh, there were some concerns specifically uh, from big companies in the Bordeaux area. Uh, these are being discussed together with NCNCF. Interestingly, Air France was already working with SNCF since 1995, and uh, we currently have, with the addition of eight additional routes in domestic France uh, in 2021, we now offer 33 routes where we have the train and air concept. So it is, uh, it is going well, it is improving. What we're seeing is that beyond two and a half hours, it really becomes complicated because regions are... Um, less connected to the world, less connected to economic participation, educational participation, cultural exchange. It makes it more harder. And we also want, and I think this was also part of the discussion in the previous panel, um, the just transition. We don't want to leave people behind. So uh, it's important that we have the sustainable transformation, but we also want to be sure that it is just for all, uh, all people. Just transition is a very good keyword, which we'll come back to a little later. But so if we look at responsible flying, it really means looking at alternatives. Uh, and of course, taking the train, taking the coach is considered a, a more environmentally friendly way on a per person emission side of the equation. So I'm, I'm turning to Andrea here at Flix Mobility. Um, what do you see are the innovations in the world of coach and buses that we can uh, look forward to? Hi, uh, thanks for the question. Well, the, let's put the innovations to a little later um, because in, indeed we don't, look, we don't need to look into innovations if we want to look into sustainable travel. Already now, and there I would like to give you some numbers, uh, using a coach or a bus is with regards to CO2 consumption much more environmental friendly than um, using a car. And I'm talking about classical uh, drives now or fossil drives, not electricity or a plane. So to give you concrete numbers, we have done a study with our NGO partner atmosphere to understand what is the CO2 consumption per driven passenger kilometer. 
and it is about 26 grams. Um, if you, for example, go from Berlin to Paris by a bus, um, you have a five times lower um, emission than with a car and 10 times lower than a plane. Now, there are distances that uh, customers might choose to travel with other means of transport, but our plea is to look into, uh, as, as uh, Gloria just said, it's a choice, it's the customer's choice, and the offer we think coaches and trains are giving to the customers is attractive. Um, and we have not talked yet about innovations, which is talking about uh, alternative drives such as hydrogen or biogas, which we are piloting as well. But there, to be really honest, we are lacking a lot of things to mm. make that realistic. So there is no infrastructure yet. There, you, you cannot charge those buses. Um, uh, the technology partners are not ready. So this is, we are working on this, piloting and starting with industry partners to, to look into alternative drives, but this is still quite a way to go. Um, and that is why our approach is to try and convince our customers that collective travel, collective travel in buses and trains is a good choice. A sustainable choice. Mm. Thank you. And if we may stay on this subject of innovation, um, Sebnam, we will then get back to you with the next question, but just quickly back to Fatima on this, because innovation is going to be so key at decarbonizing air travel. And you already mentioned some partnerships that you have with the university. We just heard from Andrea, there's a partnership with an NGO with Atmosphere. So talk to us a little bit more about all of those partnership to reach your goals, to be innovative. You mentioned the sustainable aviation fuel that you're using. Alone, it can't happen. So how is this innovation happening and in which partnerships? Absolutely. Uh, interestingly, the airlines themselves are very much dependent on the rest of our partners in the value chain. So we need the electric aircraft. Uh, we need the hydrogen aircraft that are coming from, uh, from our partners. Um, electric aircraft, uh, they might appear around 2020-35. They are especially going to be interesting, by the way, on the regional part. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen planes, the uh, issue there is um, hydrogen is uh, higher in weight, uh, bigger in volume. That is why you need uh, more technological breakthroughs. So we are, of course, very closely working with uh, the aircraft uh, uh, producers. When it comes to sustainable aviation fuels, we are very deeply engaged both in supporting new entrants to the markets. Uh, there are several calls for projects, for instance, in France, where uh, in addition to traditional players, we are really trying to support and help new parties to the market. We are part of alliances with other uh, airlines. We work together with our SkyTeam Alliance partners. So we really try to activate every single uh, possibility we have. A lot of this is invisible to most of the people. Uh, so I'm, I'm really very happy uh, with, this, uh, with this question. So the same goes for uh, optimization of flight paths or a lot of the systems that are running an airline behind the scenes, uh, electrification of ground equipment. So we, we have um, uh, meetings with our suppliers and we invite them to come with ideas, how can you help us decarbonize this industry? So it is really a widespread cross-sector uh, partnership that we have. We activate our corporate accounts when we talk about corporate soft programs. So it is really going the entire sector. We, uh, we, we work with them, yeah. We've heard, uh, it's interesting you mentioning this because we've heard a lot about uh, the power of collaboration and cooperation actually in earlier panels and it seems that in the mobility sector we're seeing the same thing. So let's bring in one important pillar in that story and it is the travelers themselves. Uh, and now, now we turn to, to Seb Nem here at Google. You've introduced actually many new features over the past months. Um, you can look at booking flights that have lower carbon footprints. Uh, you have you know, the search engine users are now able to, to see the associated carbon emissions on every flight, on every route, and then they, they can choose the lower carbon options. Uh, you've uh, also have, you show the carbon emissions, I think, that are associated by the 
same trip, but if they're done by train, uh, if I'm correct, in the EU. Uh, in the US, you have this uh, eco-friendly or more eco-friendly routing um, uh, through Google Map. Um, so what, is the, um, what we're interested here is what is this data saying behind that? I mean, on, on providing that level of transparency to uh, the, 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 the bookers or to the, to the uh, browsers is, is something that travelers are looking at. Is it making a difference in the way that they're booking, in the way that they're planning their trip? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So I, I just want to take a step back and, and would like to talk a little bit about how we are approaching sustainability in Google. Yeah. So since our early days, Google has focused on developing services, significantly improved the lives of billions of people while operating our own business in an environmental sustainable way. So we became carbon neutral in 2007, and now we have the ambitious goal of becoming carbon free in 2030. So we aim to be global leader in sustainability by implementing solutions at scale. And this means that our commitment to sustainability includes everyone. So in fact, last year, we pledged to help 1 billion users to make more sustainable choices by the end of this year. And when it comes to travel, so Google plays a vital role in the travel ecosystem. And people around the world come to Google every day, as you mentioned, to research their uh, options for flights, hotels, or go to Google Maps to look at the options. So what we see is like since the pandemic, consumer interest in sustainability is on the rise. And if you look at the report uh, from, for example, Booking.com, there is a sustainable travel report. So 82% of consumers say it's more top of mind than before. So we see an increasing demand. Last year, there was a survey from Euromonitor, and it says that more than 70% of global travelers say they're more interested um, in sustainable travel options. And then the, about the same amount, 70% says that like travel companies should offer more sustainable options. So, however, despite the interest and the desire to travel more sustainably, a recent another survey shows that nearly a quarter of global consumers don't know how. And that's what we are solving for. So our main mission is to make an impact on travel sustainability, is to enable travelers to make more sustainable choices. So to make that happen, we've created a new team of engineers and designers and researchers focused solely on uh, travel sustainability. And as you mentioned, we have launched a couple of features last year. So when you look at the impact on the consumer behaviors, sustainability information is now part of the research journey. And so we are helping surface this information. So in our own search data, we have also seen that, that people are increasingly looking for sustainable travel options. For example, searches for Echo Hotel have grown steadily. And, and we have seen this through our testing in our Google Flights as well. So when consumers can see the carbon emissions impact in their flight options, they're more likely to avoid flights with higher emissions. So in travel, if you ask us, we are at the education stage for sustainability, and we know that promoting sustainability is not something we can do alone. As you already mentioned, so collaboration is the key, um, and it's critical that we take an industry-wide approach to ensure that there's a consistency uh, wherever consumers research their or, or plan their trips, so that I understand, trust, and take action on the information they receive. Um, yeah, so it's it's more like we we all have the responsibility to educate the users and also provide more information to the users. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly leading on to this issue of transparency with the users and the consumers, right? If we have the data, we can be transparent, we can be educational and informative. So when it comes to booking your travel, which potentially not just happens through Google, you go directly to KLM or you go directly to Flixbus, um, you offer your... Um, consumers, your guests, your travelers, offsetting options. Um, at KLM, you have ZO20 um, program, which looks at reforestation project and sustainable aviation fuel. You mentioned it. So you leave the consumer the choice. Um, Andrea, I'm presuming that you have something similar. So talk to us. Do you think it's the right way to leave it as a voluntary mechanism? Or do you think it's something that you want to actually implement as something that goes automatically? Um, potentially, Andrea, I'm going to ask you first, and then Fatima, maybe you want to chip in. So we see that between 5 to 10 percent of our customers use the, op the option to offset uh, their trip. Uh, we would love to have more. Um, we at Flix don't believe that we should 
you know, uh, prohibit things or make them like, how did you call it? I Man don't mandatory. Think. Yeah, mandatory. Mm -hmm. That's not our company culture. But what we do is we think about means on how can we how can we increase that. And um, this is one of our goals. We see in, on a worldwide average, it's around 6% in Germany, uh, 10%. We do give this option by in every ticket booking, there's the option to, to offset um, and compensate. And we are pushing the, this further in order to increase the numbers. Fatima, at your end, and, do you, yes. and does greenwashing come into this that, you know, your clients sort of accuse you of that with this system? Of greenwashing? Uh, I'm being controversial. Uh, <laughs> so, indeed, we, we use um, a complementary approach. So, uh, like I said, we have started implementing um, sustainable aviation fuels from for flights the equal volume uh, is a one and a half, a half to one percent for all um, flights from france and the netherlands that is part of a soft contribution which is part of your ticket price we chose on purpose to be transparent to the customer because we also want to raise the awareness of what what is the cost involved with sustainable aviation uh, fuel in addition to having indeed the the alternative for offsetting and um stuff uh, during the booking process. Now, offsetting today uh, is solar, wind, um, afforestation, reforestation. And it's true when it comes to um, forestation, the long term, it will probably help, but uh, it is less, um, less quick than saying, I remove CO2 from, uh, from the air. Mm. It is, however, a tool we have right now, and it does help. And that is why it is important to continue offsetting and new offsetting techniques are appearing. And for instance, we are already looking at the emergence of direct air capture technologies. These technologies are being used both to use CO2 for synthetic fuels, but in the future, you can also use direct air capture for direct removal from the air. Uh, it needs all of this become much more commercially viable than it is today. But starting to invest today is important for the future. So offsetting, definitely it helps. Um, it is an important part of decarbonization. Is it the only answer? No. So that is why indeed we are very much on this dual approach uh, invest in stuff, make sure that it emerges as quickly as possible, go quicker than what Fit for 55 is uh, prescribing. That is really what we are pushing. Uh, we, we are really going to be more ambitious, uh, uh, but the production needs to be there. Yeah, we're. Uh, I mean, if we if we can circle back a little bit, so there's uh, this there's quite a bit of a packaging here. There's the flyer responsibility. So there is the consumer side of making the right decision. There is the investment that the companies have got to do. There is uh, the, the, and partly making sure that you have an offsetting scheme, which is not the holy grail. It's a part of the decarbonization path. I'd like to circle back to Thomas here on the uh, personal transportation, the car transportation, flying responsibly. I think we've got the point. Is there such a thing as driving responsibly? And if so, what would that look like? I mean, apart from our navigation systems, obviously uh, offering uh, diverse routes, including an, um, CO2 optimized routing. Uh, there are practical means uh, if you take, for example, our plug-in hybrids. Um, we have developed together with the city of Rotterdam and the Erasmus University a few years ago a system whereby once you cross a certain demarcation line, uh, when you enter a city, uh, you will automatically go into the electric drive mode. So in order to optimize uh, the usage of the uh, electric vehicles, in order to motivate people to have a bigger share of electric driving in hybrids, this has proven to be very effective. And we have rolled it out based on this pilot activity across the market. And it's become a serious feature in the meantime. 
so I think there is um, a lot to do that can be done in order to better connect uh, navigation information, routing, uh, and the operation mode of the car. Mm, so we're, we're seeing actually quite a few additional features that are being developed. And again, I, you've just talked about the power of partnership and collaboration with that university in particular in developing this. I'm turning to Xenia. Uh, I'm not sure, do we have questions from the audience that we want to pick up? We have a lot of very exciting questions. Um, and to, to keep with the, with the topic of being slightly um, controversial, um, Back to you, Fatima. Is growth still a realistic goal for the airline sector? And isn't this directly opposed to becoming more sustainable, which is quite similar to what we heard with the hotels? Can you expand your hotel portfolio and still remain within the goals of being car becoming carbon neutral? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I think... Here you need to take a step back uh, and not look only at Europe, but what is happening at a global level. So we know that uh, in the past, the uh, travel that was taking place uh, around the globe, approximately 70% of that travel originated from Western countries. This will probably be the reverse uh, 20 to 30 years from now. That is because big groups of people are, um, are becoming mobile and want a lifestyle and mobility and visit friends and visit family and have the same opportunities that we have in Europe. And this is going to happen. So while it is a valid uh, uh, question and while well, as I started uh, uh, the panel today with saying please uh, let's all think about how we consume responsibly in all uh, parts of our life we also need to take into account that on a global level there are major challenges that we are still facing so the quicker we are able to find solutions that bring down the decarbonization uh, uh, trajectory for all airlines, the better it is. So it is indeed a, um, an important question. Um, the idea is that you will always be quicker at decarbonizing than, uh, than you would be at growing. So what is an important milestone, and we were talking about cross-sector partnerships, we are part of IATA, we are part of the board of governors in IATA, and we were one of the parties that really um, had a lot of talks in convincing airlines around the world to move the net zero target from 2060 <coughs> to 2050. This sounds easy, it is not. Getting the whole world on board for such a target is a major uh, way forward. And we are now really talking about, okay, we have a net zero uh, ambition in 2050. How are we going to agree on midterm targets and making sure that everyone everyone is on board because climate is not a European thing. It's a global thing. Excellent. Thank you. And to, to slightly move away, I mean, there are quite a lot more questions around air travel, but I'm going to move it on to a slightly more social aspect of things because we're talking about decarbonization. But I think this is a really interesting question that goes a little bit to both Sebnem and to Andrea. Sebnem, I'm going to ask you first. Um, what are the types of transportations that are being and offers that are being developed for tourists with disabilities? And does Google do something where you can easily find those? And Andrea, is there something that Flixbus is doing to accommodate people with disabilities? Yeah, we, we will continue to deliver more sus travel sustainable to futures in the coming months. And accessibility is one of the uh, high priority topics for us. Um, so uh, stay tuned for that. Good news. So for us, this is it is for us. It is important to offer our to have our offer for everybody. We don't want to exclude anybody. Uh, we are an ex inclusive company, and um, we do as much as we can. We have certain restrictions regarding our um, our you know the 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 buses and the trains we are uh, operating. But wherever we can, we uh, do anything to support everybody to be able to travel with Flix. This is, I think, the most general answer I can give there instead of going into details. Mm. Um, but 
I would I would really love to add something that we haven't touched on so far. Maybe that's it's not an answer to this question, but we have been talking a lot about cooperating across the industries and um, joining forces to reach climate goals. For me, what I really need to 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 say here is that we also need to look into the regulatory framework we are operating in because that is what really can make a huge change as well if it comes to uh, collective travel and how how is how open is the european union and the world for competition because the more competition we have the more offer we can we can give to our um, customers and the more people are able to travel um, with collective travel means, and this is something that we are we are fighting for in our daily um, jobs. And um, I would like to leave a pledge here, <laughs> um, because without competition and fair level playing field, we cannot reach climate goals. Mm, but uh, Andrea, maybe we can pick up on this just uh, just shortly, because. As as people are thinking, perhaps in, in their in their travel plans for this coming summer and so on, uh, is that feeding into the barriers that you face uh, with coach travel, with traveling by bus, and and how do you, beside those regulatory issues, how do you overcome some of the barriers that people may have regarding coach travel? As I was thinking about what could barriers be, and I think that the biggest barrier might be the length of the trip. Um, but um, as the theme of of today, you know, the, the journey, the way, the journey is the way. Um, so we know that we will never be able to compete against a plane if it comes to long distance trips. But apart from that, the only the barriers we are facing is being able to to reach uh, big city centers with our buses, um, not being prohibited to enter centers in order to pick people up where they want to be picked up, um, being able to offer attractive prices and being treated fair. For example, I, I give you an example. The, in Germany, uh, the VAT has been decreased for trains, but not for buses, even though we think we are complementary and should be treated equal. So those are the things we are suffering from and automatically our customers are also suffering from. With time in mind and knowing the crisis that we are facing currently with oil prices going up thanks to what is going on in the Ukraine and Rus uh, Russia, um, Looking at 2022, how do you, especially this um, applies to BMW, Flixbus and KLM more, dependent on oil and fossil fuels still, how do you see 2022 panning out for you and without losing the eye on the ball of sustainability? Um, I will pass it on to the gentleman in the room first. Thank you. I mean, there is a direct impact on our supply chains, as uh, for many others uh, uh, in the car industry. Uh, we are facing um, the loss of uh, supply with components at the moment, which causes interruptions in our production. So this is the immediate effect that we have at the moment, uh, why we also have discontinued um, uh, business in the region, as you can imagine. Um, if we look at uh, the debate around climate and around energy security, uh, we are affected by this in multiple manners. Obviously, there is uh, fuel pricing, the impact we are seeing at the moment. Um, and the other hand, also as a manufacturer, uh, we are using fossil gas uh, for parts of our facilities. Uh, our suppliers do so. Um, so this means that uh, there is an impact uh, in a multifaceted manner. And we can only hope uh, and support everything that helps in overcoming this, this situation. Fatima. Yeah, um, I think uh, Carl uh, was uh, at uh, the ICB before. He already gave us uh, some information about how we are dealing with the current crisis. We were, of course, just coming out of Corona. So this is not easy. We know that on the way to Asia, we currently cannot fly over, uh, over Russia. So this, of course, has a high impact on our entire operation. 
Uh, important to know sustainability, uh, I said it before, it's something that has been at the heart of Air France and KLM for the past 20 years that is not going to change. So it is very much part of our DNA today and we only want to accelerate where we can. So I think uh, whatever the crisis is, we will face it and we will move towards the sustainable uh, tourism area because I think we have a responsibility all together here a sustainable tourism and travel area um, as quickly as possible. Excellent. And Andrea and Sebnem, this doesn't exclude you. I'm just going to go through um, Andrea and then you can also tell us how you plan to keep on the ball this year. Yes, well, um, as Gloria said, our number one priority at the start of this year has been uh, ramping up our business um, after Corona. Now we're facing uh, a war and um, to be honest, parts of the teams are also very occupied by trying to help refugees traveling uh, out of the country and um, bringing goods into the country. So the, the, the gas and the fuel price is something we also look at at the moment, but we have different priorities. Uh, we monitor this very closely, but we haven't adapted our prices uh, so far. Um, we would we always want to stay very competitive. You know um, that we are known for our low price, for our very low prices. This is our competitive advantage apart from the sustainable means of travel. Um, so there's a bunch of of uh, very challenging topics in our business at the moment, but we are confident because. We have a world-class team and we will manage around this and be there for our customers. Thank you. And Sebnem? Yeah, I, I, I just want to say, so we have been talking about collaboration in good times and bad times and in terms of sustainability. So this is not uh, something we can do alone. So as, as Google, we are ready to provide uh, our, our collaboration and support, like our technology tools and insights, both to our partners and, and to the industry. Thank you so much. Uh, I look to you, uh, Thomas. Thank you so much for joining Fatima, Andrea and Sebnem this morning for your insights at the ITB Berlin 2022. We wish you the best of success, of course, in these difficult times. But of course, you keep the ball of sustainability up and going. Thank you so much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much.